Chapter 2 The Philology of Existence The Dramaturgy of Force Quoting Thus Spoke Zarathustra on Human Prudence Is not hurt vanity the mother of all tragedies? All the vain are good actors. They act, and they want people to enjoy looking at them. All their spirit is behind this will. They enact themselves. Near them I love to look at life, and that cures my melancholy. It is characteristic of one type of important aesthetic theory that it never discusses a phenomenon without incorporating some element of what is being discussed into the discourse itself. The birth of tragedy out of the spirit of music is not only a manifesto on the polarity between the Apollonian and Dionysian artistic drives, but is itself the result of the interplay of energies that are both raging and resistant, intoxicating and precise. It does not concern itself merely with the occurrence of the Dionysian religion of art in antiquity, but instead directs itself towards a verbal passion play based on old and new heroes with neo-religious gestures of ecstasy. It not only addresses the origins of tragedy and universal human suffering as it is manifested in music, but also presents itself as a rhetorical noturno within which opinions that are too severe to be heard without producing despair can be voiced from beneath a toned-down veil of well-formed sentences and attestations of courage. Because it is a discourse on art that is nearly art itself, Nietzsche's early work has become a model for much of what has been brought forth since then in the field of aesthetic theory. It is a discourse in which subjects who have been trained in science remind themselves of their extra-scientific existence. Under the pretext of a theory of antiquity, Nietzsche the philologist here devoted his attention to his own existence and to the passions of the present. At the halfway point between aesthetics and science, a new art of indirect confession arises. For what? if not the manifestation of his own psychodrama, can be at issue when an author extends himself with a reckless sense of superiority beyond historical facts in order to outline a new image of Hellenic culture and its tragic psycho-spiritual foundation. An image that exhibits traces of late romanticism and manifests a fin de cycle pathos as though it were nothing more than a matter of translating Greek mythology into the metaphysics of bourgeois pessimism and the suffering of the heroes of antiquity into modern-day gestures of inner discord. Within this context, however, the historical accuracy of the representation is less important than the intensity of the contemporary projection. On the path towards his inquiry into the self, the modern philologist stumbles upon traces of antiquity that can no longer be dealt with in philological terms. Similar to the way in which Schliemann exhumed the true dreams of his childhood from the ruins of hills that had been buried for millennia, Nietzsche brought to light in the course of his philological excavations a layer of tableau that had been, so to speak, buried alive the truth content of which was older and more acerbic than that of self-confident research into antiquity and modern-day manifestations of individualism. It is in both cases a matter of becoming valuable, fundig in an almost psycho-archaeological sense. The singing he-goats who scream over the stage in Nietzsche's hallucinatory vision of antiquity are less ancient satyrs in a state of orgiastic ecstasy than exemplary modern subjects with their accursed good breeding and their cultural discontent. Is it even possible here to persist in speaking of modern subjects? Is not the end result of Nietzsche's excavations into our cultural arche 
precisely the undermining of the new subject by the forces inherent in the old drama? Indeed, is it not to a lesser extent an undermining or subversioning of the subject in a psychoanalytic sense, and much more an ontological derealizing, entwirklichung, an inundation by impersonal energies, and the reduction of the subject to an effect of antagonistic forces and the conflicting, quote, artistic instincts of nature, end quote. The ego, and with it, its constitutive dream of autonomy, would thus represent merely the irreal seam at which the Dionysian force of vitality and sexuality encounters the Apollonian delight in vision and in dream. In the light of speculation of this kind, subjectivity, subjecthaftigkeit, appears as the epiphenomenon within the interplay between the great subjectless cosmic forces, as an elusive interspace between the tendencies towards self-preservation and self-annihilation that exist within a cruelly exuberant and unintentional natural process. The question arises as to what manner of philology this must be to acknowledge no fear when it questions the most sacred tenet of modernity, the moral dogma of the autonomy of the subject. When Nietzsche claims for himself the right to formulate a theory of the drama that then expands into a proto-history of subjectivity, he has ostentatiously placed himself upon a podium that no longer resembles his academic lectern, and can no longer be considered a fundamental component of his role as a bourgeois academic. But what kind of stage is it to which the philologist of the future ascends? Its cultural status was, in Nietzsche's time, anything but unequivocal, and has remained so to this day. The question cannot be answered even in terms of a quick association with depth psychology and psychoanalysis, because these are merely descriptively positive titles for something that radically defies clear definition, something that is evasive and negative. In any case, it would appear to be a stage upon which modern individuals act out a drama that could be characterised as their search for self again risking a falsely positive nomenclature. Elevated to such a stage, theory becomes dramaturgically porous and is permeated with the most powerful instinctual existential tensions of those who do their thinking upon it. Thus even philology, initially so well behaved, can become adventurous. Within this context, Theory is no longer a discursive mechanism that is served and reconstructed by the functionaries of thought, but instead represents a stage upon which life is transformed into an quote, experiment on the part of the perceiver. End quote. He who wants to step upon the stage wants to distinguish himself in a specific sense. His intention is to betray himself. But he wants to do so in order to force the dilemma, whose mask he feels himself to be, into plain view, to the point to at which it will betray itself. A mode of thought that has been existentially blown open in this way intends no affront towards the so-called serious research, even if the latter, with its incurable dull-wittedness, understands it as such. Rather, its attention is to replenish the vital essence of this research. He who permits himself to think in this way does so not to get away with accomplishing less, but to risk more. He who takes the stage as a thinker, and takes a chance as a spokesman for an experimental existence, must from that point, forward, that point onward assume an all-encompassing responsibility for the immediate and the indirect truth value of his performance. At the same time, he has earned the right to have everything that he brings forward used against him, quote-unquote, before the law. Quote 
against him and at the same time in his defence. And this right means a great deal to anyone who has placed himself by way of radical self-sacrifice beyond the shallow position of being simply either for or against. Before the law. This would indicate a second stage upon which the adventurer of theory and the hero of thought no longer figures personally, but upon which instead his critics, his fans and all those who, because of their openness to his suggestions, feel they have earned the right to hold the groundbreaking thinker accountable for his provocations. The extremely specific relationship between Nietzsche's writing and both his contemporary public and posterity can best be characterised through the image of the dual stage, one upon which the thinker exposes and implicates himself, and the other upon which those who agree with him and follow his thought test the applicability of the protagonist's truths to their own lives. If a dramatised reflection is really an experiment on the part of the perceiver, then the knowledge gained from this experiment arrangement must be uh, must attract attention as the self-realizations of the thinker, while his mistakes are recognized as his personal failings. Thinking on stage is more likely to generate truth by following the archaic models of the wager, or divine judgment, than through the modern schematic of discursive inference from principles. In accordance with a totally apothecary concept of truth, Apothecarischen war Heitzbegriff. And what appears here as truth is not what has been proved to be theoretically the most logical, but rather what best proves itself in the context of a successful life. Whenever the thinker brings the truth about himself to light upon the stage, he reveals himself, eo ipso, in the process of becoming what he is. If he does not do so, he exposes the truth about himself and his hypothesis in that, like the heroes of antiquity, he succumbs to his dilemma and runs aground on his own inability to understand himself. Whatever one thinks of Nietzsche, he must impress even his detractors in one respect, since in his willingness to risk intellectual truths he was the most audacious thinker of the new era. He paid the price for the danger inherent in his thinking to a degree unparalleled by almost anyone else. In his program for the stage, which was intended to lend him credibility as the new Dionysian hero, he ultimately proved himself to be above all else a hero of his own times, a hero of self-refutation. Posing and reflecting upon an open stage, he submitted himself to the law of an unrelenting self-exposure. In his attempts to become what he was, he implicated himself in the most torturous of comedies, so as to become what he was not. A hero, a superhuman, a quote-unquote superman, Uberman. The greatest discovery made in his heroic search for truth was therefore an unintentional one. He brought to light the truth about heroism as representing the continuation of a fundamental violation. The first victim of Nietzsche's debut on the stage of truth was his standing within his own profession. One must first be familiar with what was common practice within the field of classical philology and its critical methodology which, with its conjecturing and hair-splitting, was part renunciatory and part subordinate, before one can appreciate the grotesque gap between Nietzsche's attempt to push forward and what was customary within the field. What Nietzsche carried out was not a mere switch to a different specialisation, a transfer from philology to philosophy. What he accomplished was nothing less than academic suicide, from this point forward, Nietzsche no longer addresses antiquity as a classical scholar. Whenever he does call upon the ancients, it is as a modern mystagogue and a leader of orgies, who always speaks from a perspective of inner simultaneity with the early Greek mysteries, 
Dionysus, Apollo, Ariadne, the Sphinx, the Minotaur, Silenus. From that point on, these are simply mythological names for contemporary forces and allegories for acute sensations of pain. Modernity is thus no longer merely a name given to a volcanic process of repulsion on the part of an undetermined present in the face of its own prehistory. Foresight. For Nietzsche, it becomes concurrently the most accidental point of departure for the rediscovery of the basic truths of Greece. As is the intellectual custom, Sigmund Freud him proved himself a generation later to be the truest of Nietzsche's indirect students, in that he also attempted to formulate his psychological opinions in the language of a time-obliterating modern mythology. But how is an actualism, actualismus, of this sort possible? How can a modern individual, contrary to all rules of historical consciousness, want to place himself into a position of contemporaneousness with concepts that are so temporally and culturally far removed? What right does a modern thinker have to extinguish an interval of 2,500 years so that he can talk about the drama of the ancient Greeks as though he were discussing an intimate personal experience? Two observations on Nietzsche's way of positioning himself on the stage of thought can provide us with answers to these questions. First, even before he had voiced a single word upon the stage, Nietzsche was made ripe for it by his decision before the fact to present, quote, something great, end quote, on the subject of the Greeks. What has been described here as his characteristic, quote unquote, cult of genius, refers not only to a psychic disposition on his part, but also to a preliminary methodological decision on what his relationship with the historical material would be. As Faust called upon the spirit of the earth, Erdgeist, so Nietzsche calls upon the spirit of genius in early Greece to answer the question, how does one mind speak to another? And he himself provides the answer. The Greek world discusses its most puzzling mysteries, to its greatest advantage, with a certain professor in Basel who, because he is on the scandalously intimate terms with Lady Antiquity, will one day be a former and ridiculed professor. Nietzsche's radical quote-unquote actualism is therefore an expression of his quote-unquote cult of genius, vis-a-vis -vis early Greek thought and poetry. The cult of genius, however, is to a substantial degree of concurrent genius, congenialismus, and subsequently it results in the conviction that anything exceptional can be understood only by its equal. That is, greatness can be recognised only by an equal greatness, depth by an equal degree of depth, suffering by an equal suffering, and the heroic through an equal heroism. Nietzsche's concept of concurrent genius has in any case forced the issue to such an extent that it conceived of the intellectual history of Europe as representing merely a spiritual migration on the part of the great intellects whose path had led from Homer and Heraclitus to Kant and Schopenhauer and through them to Wagner and Nietzsche, a migration that always took place of course at the lonely heights where Aside from these thinkers, only eagles could survive. The second prerequisite for Nietzsche's actualistic conjuring up of Hellenism lies in his historical philosophical claims. Whenever Nietzsche takes the stage as a prophetic Greek scholar, he is wearing not only the mask of the genial hero of thought, but also that of a philosopher of history, or more correctly, a mythologist of history. Equipped with its power of authority, he condenses the past 2,500 years, with a pathetic lack of concern, into a simple wave-like or circular movement. Accordingly, the initial depth of the early Greek tragic consciousness is lost in favour of a vulgar, optimistic conception of the world that succeeds in a form of Socratic enlightenment. The ruthless insipidity of which is eventually denounced 
and must lead sooner or later to the rebirth of a tragic consciousness. European intellectual history thus appears as the ebb and flow of a single motif that circles around or undulates between ascent, descent and return. Nietzsche's construction of history possesses the primitive circularity of myth. What circles is a heroic pessimism that is born and dies like a living being, certain of being reborn. We observe here an archaic triad, the birth of tragedy out of the spirit of music, the death of tragedy because of the optimistic levelling program of a so-called enlightenment, and the rebirth of tragedy out of the spirit of German music, by which he meant the music of the present, which bore the mark of Richard Wagner. He who speaks in such mythic formulas has ceased to report as a historian on things that have actually existed. He has left the dust-grey archives and entered the arena, or, to put it a better way, the maternity ward, in which European culture is reborn as a tragic one. In this way, the mythologist of history is transformed into a midwife at the rebirth of phenomena that will burst forth today, or, at the latest, tomorrow. Even this formulation does not go far enough. Nietzsche cannot be content to sit as a kind of tragic gynaecologist before the birth canal of the intellect and wait for whatever might appear. He himself begins surreptitiously, and yet as if he were being enticed by an irresistible allure, to play the role of the one who is again giving birth. In the ardour of his prophecy, he simultaneously becomes the pregnant mother, the gynaecologist, and the divine child. In representing himself as the assistant present at the rebirth, Nietzsche was no doubt alluding to Wagner, the musical orgy leader, who once again lifted the musical drama to the present, of the present to tragic heights. But in making this allusion, he also included himself as its fulfiller, incarnate Logos, and true son, in whom the master could be well pleased. In doing this, Nietzsche drew attention not to the epic, but rather to the dramatic basic structure of modern philosophies of history. For that which occurs on the level of greatness is staged not in terms of narrative, but in terms of theatre. However peaceful the tone might be in which one expresses these historical philosophical theses, they always include the dramatic intervention of the speaker in a phenomenon that is understood as one of universal historical importance. He who proclaims a theory of progress inevitably includes himself as a participant, supporter and culmination point in the drama of progress. He who presents a theory of decline asserts himself as someone affected by that decline whether this takes the form of lamentation, resignation, or simply standing one's ground. He who diagnoses rebirths or periods of change brings himself into play as an obstetrician, an agent of change, or even as a candidate for reincarnation. And finally, he who prophesies decline declares himself a moribundus, a practitioner of euthanasia, a hired mourner, as ultimately someone who exploits the carrion of a dying culture. This was true of Spengler, who was not content with simply diagnosing the decline of the West, but who also presented himself as an exemplary, fatally clever, Sturbungsklug, latter-day barbarian who kept a stoic, cynical watch during the death agony of European civilization. Viewed in this light, historical philosophical speech acts are the speech acts of a cultural orientation par excellence. The description of one's own historical position determines the quality of one's historical pose. Where, however, should these speech acts be performed if not on the dramatic stage of thought, upon which the engaged actors themselves intervene in the fate of their culture? <laughs> 
we are able to recognize a Nietzsche more clearly than in anyone else, with Lenin being the only exception of equal stature. The fact that great historical philosophical oratory allows the speaker to burst forth like a force majeure, whereby this oratory reaches a crisis point in a self-realization as a proclamation of self on the part of the speaker, and not without this realization being inserted most narrowly into the tendencies and potentiality of the moment. He who speaks like a modern mythologist of history always does so because the time for it is ripe within him. For this reason, the choice of words governed by convenience, Gelegenheit, also comprises consistently chirological, chirologische, phenomena, by which I mean, in the highest sense of the term, timely condensations of circumstances into phenomenological verbalizations and personifications. The thinker on the stage does not speak as a fool so much as his own initiative. Rather, he speaks, in that he is pursuing his own concern, in the name of the quote-unquote universal moment that is being interpreted through him. The subjectivity of the speaker is elevated by this, purified of the interests of arrogance and transformed into a phenomenon. Every essential historical moment is, however, as Walter Benjamin knew, a quote-unquote moment of danger. And it is this danger that mediates all subjectivity. Thus one can also say, presuming a slight taste for dark formulation, that it is not the thinker who is engaging himself in thinking. Rather, it is this danger that engages itself and thinks through him. We must be adamant on this point. From behind the camouflage of genius and a historical mythological enthusiasm, Nietzsche is able to set about discussing his concept of Hellenism with an unrestrained sense of contemporaneity. From here on, historical references were, serve only as a foundation for the performance of the most contemporary of plays. To be sure, the fable upon which Nietzsche bases his attempt is of an archetypal simplicity, as elementary as it as the most as elementary as the most ancient philosophy and as monotonic as archaic music. What is a human being? What is the world? Why must the world cause us to suffer? How can we be released from the suffering? These questions have an almost flat and superficial ring when measured against the shocking violence with which the isolated consciousness awakened to the dilemma that is raging within it, is frightened by its own individuation, and after having been thus frightened, no longer is anything but the craving to understand that within it is really of any consequence. Let me try and say that again. No longer is anything but the craving to understand what within it is really of any consequence. Who am I? What will be my fate? Why must I be I? There are no other questions. In the initial stages of his performance, Nietzsche is still somewhat removed from reducing his undertaking to this primary form. This does not hinder him from already expressing himself within it, together with his Hellenist decorum, his Schopenhauerian vocabulary, his illusionist rhetorical coquetry, and the educated bourgeois cast of his drapery. None of this can alter the fact that in his first book, as will be the case in general in his later literary work, the dramatic primary structure of the search for the genuine self begins to function with great clarity. Motivated by a powerful need to express himself, the thinker steps out onto the stage, borne up by the certainty that his previous presentiments were sufficient to warrant making a spectacular entrance whatever might still separate him from the latest views. Certainly the actor does not yet know how this compulsion will express itself, and he is certain that the last word cannot be spoken for a long time yet. At the same time, because he is beset by the feeling that he is pregnant with great things, he is convinced that he has said something of the utmost significance, 
what else can a man do who is convinced that the greatest man of his time, Richard Wagner, has acknowledged him as an equal? The drama begins as if the actor wants to say, I am here, but I am not yet myself. I must therefore become myself. I would therefore wager that what I really have to say will be revealed as the drama runs its course. This might possibly be the fundamental formulation of that thought that is marked by the dynamic between the search for self and the attempt to release oneself from it. The thinker is not yet in possession of himself to such an extent that he can present himself to the world, world with the gesticulation of Ece Homo. But he does promise that he will succeed in retrieving himself through a process of radical self-searching, quodam publico. The overall effect is as if his shadow should say to the wanderer, if I pursue you with a sufficient degree of intensity I will finally possess you. Or the reverse, as if the wanderer were to say to the shadow, I must first jump over you before I can arrive at myself. As paradoxical as this all may sound, these duplications of the ego into the seeker and what is thought, the questioner and who he answers, the present self and the self that is yet to be, belong inexorably to the structure of an impassioned existential search for truth. In chapter 3 I will comment further on the paradoxical nature of the search as a means for avoiding the truth. In order to discover the truth about himself, therefore, the thinker must initially proceed from himself as relentlessly as he can, because otherwise nothing else that could be found would be available for him, except for the non-objective impulse. Like all of those who think creatively, Nietzsche must first rehearse what he is to say before he can know what he is actually been carrying within him. This reminds us of the familiar joke. How can I know what I am thinking before I have heard what I am saying? This makes it clear in my case that the joke has more descriptive power than the serious postulation that thinking precedes its expression. In truth, the joke illustrates the most abbreviated form, the structure of the search for truth. Therefore, he who seeks the truth about himself in a positive representation must first realize himself positively in order to find anything in this realization that would permit him to discover himself. For previously there had been, for lack of expression, nothing to discover, because nothing had been expressed for lack of its having been sought. Assuming that we are now in a position appropriate to follow Nietzsche's appearance as the announcer of another Hellenism, what does he say about the Greeks, and through them about himself? To what extent could a new approach on the psychology of the Greek populace and Greek art also bring to light any truth about the reckless Greek scholar? One can, I believe, summarise the fundamental assertions of Nietzsche's definition of the world as it is introduced to us in the book on tragedy in two statements. The first of these would be the following. The usual individual life is a hell made up of suffering, brutality, baseness and entanglement for which there is no more apt assessment than the dark wisdom of the Dionysian Silenos that the best thing for a man would to have been never born and the next best is to die as soon as possible. The second statement would read, This life is made bearable only by intoxication and by dreams. By this twofold path to ecstasy that is open to individuals for self-redemption. The birth of tragedy is to a great extent a paraphrase of the second statement and a fantasy of the possibility of unifying both forms of ecstasy in a single religious artistic phenomenon, a phenomenon Nietzsche identified as early Greek tragedy. The path of intoxication is delegated to the god Dionysus and his orgiastic manifestations. The way of the dream to the god Apollo and his love for clarity visibility and beautiful limitation. 
To Dionysus belongs music and its narcotic and cathartic power. To Apollo belongs the epic mythos with its blissful clarity and visionary effortlessness. The individual who is weighed down by everyday misery therefore has available to him two paths for lifting himself out of his misery. Two paths that can unite to form the royal path of a single tragic art. Provided one has chosen one's birth date appropriately, so that one can be incarnated either as an ancient Greek or as a modern Wagnerian. Both parts, that of intoxication and that of the dream, concern themselves in different ways with the overcoming of individuation, which is the source of all suffering. Thus intoxication has the power to lead the individual out of the limitations of his ego, in order to release him into the ocean of a cosmic unity of pain and pleasure. Whereas the dream has the capacity to transfigure the individualized subjects as necessary forms of existence under the law of proportion, limitation, and beautiful form. The tragic work of art materializes when the Dionysian and Apollonian elements fuse with each other. This fusion takes place for Nietzsche under the Dionysian sign of intoxication because it comprehends the Apollonian elements of drama, the epic stage plot, and the mythic fate of the hero, as only the dreams of the ecstatic chorus, which sees in the visible fates of the heroes objectifications and the suffering god Dionysus. In fact, Nietzsche's book on tragedy is almost always fixed to the apparent dimensions of its contents and read as a Dionysian manifesto. However, a dramaturgical reading leads with the greatest possible certainty to the opposite conclusion. What Nietzsche brings forth upon the stage is not so much the triumph of the Dionysian as its compulsion towards an Apollonian compromise. Even this reading would seem somewhat scandalous when compared to the classical image of Greek culture because it no longer recognises the serene authority of Apollo as self-evidently given, but instead teaches it as representing a courageous victory over an alternative world of dark and obscene forces that does not alter the fact that in Nietzsche, from a dramaturgical perspective, the Apollonian world of illusion has the last word. Whether or not this illusion dances henceforth before our eyes with an infinitely deeper opalescence. It is almost as if the humanistic elements of Greek culture were suddenly being expected to acknowledge that this beautiful Apollonian man's world actually represented a Dionysian transvestite theatre, and that in the future there could be no more relying on the edifying unequivocality of the Apollonian empire of light. If one examined closely the fabric of Nietzsche's tragic universe, one would deliberately have to falsify one's gaze to not perceive that, in nature, the Dionysian element is never in power as such. The orgiastic musical element is never in danger of breaking through the Apollonian barriers. For the stage itself, the tragic space, as Nietzsche constructed it, is in keeping with his overall plan. Nothing other than a sort of Apollonian catch mechanism that ensures that no orgy will result from the orgiastic song of the chorus. The music of the singing he goats is a Dionysian paroxysm set apart in Apollonian quotation marks. And only because the quotation marks are summoned in order to make the sounds of Dionysian savagery palatable for the stage are the great dark driving forces able, their impersonal casualness, unständigkeit, notwithstanding, to bring forth their contribution to a higher culture. Within this arrangement, the impossible can also be raised to the surface, provided it acquiesces to the Apollonian quotation marks, that is, to the compulsion to articulate, symbolize, disembody, represent. Without these quotation marks, there would be, so to speak, no performance rights granted. Only when the passions have promised to behave as they should are they permitted to conduct themselves as they wish. 
the price paid for the freedom of art is the constraint imposed upon it. Nietzsche's appearance on stage thus assumes a profile that goes beyond empty pretensions. If we only saw it previously in its most superficial appearance on stage, masked by the cult of genius and its mythological pathos, and now puts on a second mask, penetrating deeper into itself and into the ancient presentation of the play. From this moment on, the empty craving for and formless claim to a great self became... Beca From this moment on, the empty craving for and formless claim to a great self become a stage phenomenon of illuminating metaphoricalness. Nietzsche's second masking as a Greek scholar tells us that this self has borne itself into a conflict, and that this conflict is between two deities who interact with each other like impulse and constraint, passion and control, release and moderation, movement and contemplation, compulsion and vision, music and image, will and representation. In our further discussion, we must accept that everything that happens on stage is being impelled forward by a conflict within the actor, a conflict that is intended to be reflected in the opposition between the two deities of art. It does seem, however, as if Nietzsche was unwilling, actually, to settle this conflict. To a much greater extent, he insisted on exposing it as something that was, to a certain degree, meant to stand before us as an eternal polarity, comparable to a sculpture carved in stone of two superhuman wrestlers, whose potential for violence is immediately apparent to anyone, without their ever having to move. Both deities seem to have been frozen in a vision of struggling movement. What is the significance of the state of affairs? We must first understand what it was that Nietzsche was decreeing with such great determination. Apollo and Dionysus, after an initial tug of war, counterbalance each other and have our interests at heart exclusively in their compromise, a resulting attention to symmetry, to the principle of equilibrium, isosthenes can therefore be attributed to Nietzsche's second mask. However, the idea of a balance is nowhere established conscientiously as such, but is instead inserted in a manner that is as surreptitious as it is energetic. In truth, the polarity between Apollo and Dionysus is not a turbulent opposition that vacillates freely between the two extremes. We are dealing much more with a stationary polarity that leads to a clandestine doubling of the Apollonian. The Apollonian unified subject, Aina, makes certain, through the mechanism of the silently established axiom of balance, that the Dionysian other never comes into play as itself, but only as the dialectical or symmetrical other to the unified subject. An Apollonian principle governs the antagonism between the Apollonian and the Dionysian. This permits us to understand why Nietzsche, although he presents himself as the herald of the Dionysian, at the same time perpetually appears with the demeanour of heroic self-control, to such an extent that what must control itself is named, emphasised and celebrated as a Dionysian musical force, but always with a sort of emphasis whereby what is stressed remains under Apollonian control. Apollo is, even within Nietzsche himself, the ruler in the antithetical relationship with his other. With the establishment of this symmetrically frozen mask made up of the two halves of the faces of both deities, Nietzsche accomplished a stroke of genius vis-a-vis self-representation that has fascinated us to this day. For far from reproaching him for not really giving full license to the Dionysian, as we would imagine the case to be after a century of liberalisation and desublimation, we must wonder at the mythological device that enabled him to open up the passage to the Dionysian a crack wider. <laughs> 
Manfred Frank has demonstrated most impressively in his book De Commenda God, The God to Come, that this device was not without preconditions, but that the groundwork for it had been laid by the thought of early Romanticism and Richard Wagner. Nietzsche's thought is established within this Dionysian fissure. However, he who begins thinking with the fissure of origin must be prepared to accept, as a logical consequence, the condition of having escaped, as also being one of dissolution and separation. Having made this acceptance possible within a excuse me, having made this acceptance possible within a cultural context is the greatest profoundly depth psychological accomplishment of romantic symbolism. Nietzsche is able to risk putting on the double mask of Apollo and Dionysus because, since Romanticism, the motif of a psychological fissure has become culturally acceptable. Even for those who were the most narcissistically sensitive and chaste, this high cultural symbolism had in the meantime become a non-contemptible means of expression available for ambivalent psychological self-representation. Nietzsche made use of the romantic capability for looking back from the rationality of the day into the reason of the night in order to scout out, in his own way, the Dionysian energetics of the foundation of being. We cannot overlook the fact that this represents an extremely mediated and guarded form of playing with primordial forces. The recollection of Dionysus is precisely not a naturalistic propodeutic of barbarism. Rather, it is the attempt to sink the foundation of culture deeper into an era of barbaric menace. In any case, Nietzsche's Dionysian fissure proves to be the most promising form for maintaining a relationship to that which precedes a conscious awareness of self, an arrangement to which one continually returns whenever the question arises as to how the Dionysian truths contained within the foundation of pain and pleasure, Schmerzlustgummt, can be integrated into the forms of modern life without our having to succumb, succumb to the barbaric risks of madness and violence. My observations with respect to Nietzsche's acknowledgement of symmetry and his opting for the submission of the Dionysian to the compulsion toward the symbolic corroborate the thesis that few 19th century books are quite as Apollonian as the birth of tragedy. The extent to which it can also be read as a Dionysian text will become apparent in chapter 4 if we imagine the esoteric concept of the Dionysian as representing philosophical, quote-unquote, thought. Nevertheless, what has been said must seem astonishing when dealing with an author who considered himself to be the rediscoverer of Dionysus. We cannot delude ourselves about one thing. Whenever Nietzsche referred in his latter work to the birth of tragedy, he did so in the famous attempt at self-criticism in the preface to Ecce Homo. He did so in spite of all his reservations about the immature features of his first book, and was consistently aware that this book would be immortal because of its new understanding of the Dionysian. His own Dionysian reading of the birth of tragedy can be explained above all through the fact that for the later Nietzsche, the word Dionysian was the equivalent of anti-Christian, heathen, immoral, tragic, adjectives that correspond overwhelmingly to the tendencies of the book on its semantic level. That this thematic prominence of the Dionysian cannot diminish the fact that this dramaturgical supremacy of the Apollonian I suggest we take a closer look at Nietzsche's construction of the Dionysian. This degree of exactness is justifiable, not least of all because in the book on tragedy there is one point at which the mystery of Nietzsche's Greek scholar concept of the Dionysian is laid bare. So bare, in fact, that there is nothing left that would require interpretation. Nietzsche exposes his Dionysian alchemy, that is, his talent for changing a he-goat into a musician, at this one point more clearly than anywhere else. Let us slowly read through this most important first chapter once again.
What is happening here? Before our eyes, nature splits the Dionysian throng into two severely differ differentiated, almost oppositional choruses, which relate to each other like culture and nature, or like civilization and barbarism. According to the author, a quote-unquote monstrous gap separates the Dionysians of Greece from those of the barbarians, a gap the highly cultured individual will never again bridge, indeed will never even be able to want to bridge. This gap will take on immeasurable significance for the theory of tragedy. We can convince ourselves of this whenever we wait for the moment at which the fictive procession of the approaching God, with its followers, rolls towards us, only be, to be divided at the very second at which the winged, beschwingt, classical philologist is attempting to join it. The element that had fascinated the philologist in the distant and as yet undivided view of this chorus of Dionysian throngs is too evident to require an explanation. For from a distance, and presuming a grandiose disregard for details, the vulgar chorus is condensed into a humanistic dream image with an irresistible power to entice. This quote from page 37. Under the charm of the Dionysian, not only is the union between man and man reaffirmed, but nature, which has become alienated, hostile or subjugated, celebrates once more her reconciliation with her lost son, man. Now the slave is a free man. Now all the rigid, hostile barriers that necessity, caprice or impudent convention have fixed between man and man are broken. Now, with the gospel of universal harmony, each one feels himself not only united, reconciled and fused with his neighbour, but as one with him, as if the veil of Maya had been torn aside and were now merely fluttering in tatters before the mysterious primordial unity. In song and dance, man expresses himself as a member of a higher community. This is what Nietzsche has written. Even though the reader might not believe his own eyes, if the text were to continue in this vein in which it has begun, the birth of tragedy would be read today as the Socialist Manifesto, one that would not have to shrink from being compared to the Communist Manifesto. The work would be read as the program for an aesthetic socialism, and as the Magna Carta for a cosmic fraternity. One would glean from this book precisely those characteristics that only vestigially shared in the image of the corresponding political organisations and ideologies. But the temptation Nietzsche feels to enter into history as the spokesman for a Dionysian socialism lasts only for a second. Just as long as it takes for the throngs of the deity to storm past at the appropriate historical distance, and the reconciliation with man and nature is directly demanded of no one. As soon as proximity provides for the dissolution of an idealistic inexactitude, all previous premises are reversed. Admittedly, to the same extent that the fusion with the whole appeared as a pure impossibility, nothing stands in the way of a sacrifice to the unattainable. But if the raven chorus of sounds, bodies and appetites comes closer, the abyss of primordial origin is opened up into that into that to which the individualized subject cannot want to revert for anything in the world. Images of horror immediately rise up. Images of fatal constriction and death by suffocation in the cavern of Eros. What appeared previously as a blessed disentanglement is now seen as a horrible dismemberment. That which longing purported to crave now causes it to recoil in horror with a definite sense of nausea in the face of its realisation. The impulse toward unification suddenly changes over into a frenzy of disintegration, and the eros of the return to the womb of earth and community is transformed into a panic of dissolution and revulsion at the prospect of the socialist volvocracy. Vulvocrati. This is the decisive moment, 
the Bacchanalian festival procession is now split apart. And while the Dionysian barbarians continue to revel in their group rut, the noble minority branches off that has placed itself under the command of the Greek will to culture. And thus, away with the barbaric Dionysians of the Orient. Away with the orgiastic sexuality of the cult of spring. Away with the compulsion towards physical contact among the people and other unappetizing subjects. Away with all this leftist, green party, all-embracing crudeness. An Apollonian intervention is demanded here. A masculine, self-aware, individualist principle should intervene. One that would confront with its purity and selectivity any sort of obscene confusion. Before the common Dionysians can become Greek and Nietzschean Dionysians, they must be filtered through a sort of preliminary purification process. This I will call, following Nietzsche's description of it, the process of Doric pre-censorship. Early Hellenism erected, so we are told, a masculine dam to protect itself against the Dionysian flood. It heroically resisted the, quote, extravagant sexual licentiousness, end quote, that was characteristic of the Valpurgis night of the barbarian Dionysus. The Doric dam construction was responsible wherever the, quote, horrible witch's brew of sensuality and cruelty became ineffective, end quote. The Dionysian feminine attempts at inundation recoil against the, quote, majestically rejecting attitude of Apollo, end quote. What is worth noting here is the radical revaluation of the Dionysian. Suddenly it no longer appears as a principle that is bent on reconciling the world, because of which all human existence would for the first time be able to achieve its true goal, but rather as a primitive force of cultural destruction, an uncouth demonic danger of uncontrollable release and dissolution. For me, the Doric state and uh, this is a quote from page forty-seven. For me, the Doric state and Doric art are explicable only as a permanent military encampment of the Apollonian, only as incessant resistance to the titanic barbaric nature of the Dionysian. For Nietzsche, then, the Doric process of pre-censorship existed in the initial stages of the Dionysian. It served to break the flood of the Dionysian against the dam of the Apollonian. The phenomenon of an art of ecstasy that has been tamed into submission to advance to culture develops for the first time out of the binary energetic complex of dam and flood, restraint and intoxication. In the beginning was the compromise, the play of force and counterforce which became inextricably interlaced with each other for the purpose of reciprocal assent. Nietzsche represents this compromise graphically and does not neglect to mention that the authority who has succeeded in reaching the compromise is Apollo and not his irresponsible opponent. Thus Apollo is the calculating subject who enters into the daring game with his own dissolution. After the same Apollo had finally reluctantly acknowledged the imperative of the demands of Dionysus, he decided, according to Nietzsche, to disarm his violent opponent by means of a reconciliation. Nietzsche goes so far as to note that this is a quote-unquote seasonably affected reconciliation. The importance of this process can hardly be overestimated, for it signifies nothing less than the primal scene of civilization, the historical compromise of Western culture. Because of the Apollonian compromise, the old orgiastic power of nature is forced upward and is welded once and for all to the register of the symbolic as artistic energy. In making this observation, Nietzsche was aware that he was speaking not of an arbitrary episode within the context of the history of Greek art, but of an event that would prove fateful for all higher civilizing processes. He says, quote, This reconciliation is the most important moment in the history of the Greek cult. End quote. And here we might add, the most important transition along the path from archaic to highly advanced forms of living. It is almost unnecessary to state that, 
these more highly developed forms bring with them an increase in fragility, an ascent to the living being toward more improbable, more perilous forms that are, as if unavoidably, enveloped in a haze of perversion. Through the inhibiting and intensifying act of power that the Apollonian compromise represents, the naive orgies of early human beings are transformed into the sentimental festival performances of more recent times. They are no longer reversions of man to the tiger and the ape, but progress towards festivals of world redemption and days of transfiguration. Only now does Nietzsche's Dionysian undertaking again come into play. After Doric pre-censorship and Apollonian resistance have done their job and erected adequate defences, the author's fascination for the Dionysian component is able to re-enter, a component that has now become completely music, completely dance, completely mystical participation and beautiful suffering. In short, In short, every higher form of stepping outside of oneself that the reverential traditional term tragedy sidesteps. Just as soon as a distance from the vulgar procession of the satyrs has been symbolically re-established, the transfiguration of the Dionysian begins anew. Bracketed within aesthetic parentheses and dramaturgical quotation marks, the singing he-goats are no longer libertines who regress to bestiality. Rather, they have been rejuvenated into the media for effecting a fusion with the foundation of being and the subjects of a musical socialism. The magic is repeated within a secure framework that serves as protection against the risks involved in an actual enchantment. From this point on, everything appears in its quote-unquote second edition. Dionysian revelers in place of Dionysian revelers. Unification in place of unification orgies in place of orgies. This process of standing in place of something is however conceived of as a process of beneficial substitution and not merely as a forfeiture of the original. Within the context of this gain, culture begins to affirm itself as quote-unquote culture instead of savagery and this quality of standing in place of something becomes the key to the mystery of the civilizing phenomenon. The ramifications of this for theories of truth will soon become apparent. In the next two chapters, I will discuss the drama dramaturgy of substitution and the metaphysics of illusion. Henceforth, the old Dionysian forces are permitted to overflow with a new licentiousness. In place of licentiousness, into the riverbed of symbolization. No wonder, then, that the path to Greek tragedy is accompanied by the, quote, greatest exaltation of all symbolic faculties, by a collective release of all symbolic powers." End quote. Through this elevation into the symbolic, the world becomes more than it was. The substitution is superior to what it replaces. What has arisen from the original surpasses it. Quote, the essence of nature is now to be expressed symbolically. We need a new world of symbols. End quote. In short, the barbaric he goat has advanced to the status of civilized goat. And if he were to think back on his wild, wild youth, although this would have to be delayed a priori, could say to himself as a post structuralist, quote, A symbol has inserted itself between me and my intoxication. A language has preceded my ability to be present only as myself, presence by mere. A discourse has taught my ecstasy to speak, but isn't it worth lamenting the fact that lamentation itself has become a discourse? End quote. The Apollonian subjectivity, however, now notices for the first time, albeit too late, the dilemma in which it has implicated itself by agreeing to a compromise with the Dionysian. From here on out, it can no longer conceive of itself aus sich selbst. Out from its own self. Hmm. Apollo has lost the illusion of his own autonomy. 
in his attempts to re-establish it to the extent that he can, he must sink ever deeper into the discernment of his own lack of a foundation. Bowden Lozerkite, after he has glanced into the Dionysian abyss beneath his forms, uh, sorry, beneath the forms, after he has glanced into the Dionysian abyss beneath the forms, Apollo is no longer able to believe in his substantial rationality and his masculine self-control. His initial hope of being able to negotiate a compromise with the Dionysian, in which he will be able to preserve himself unaltered, is revealed as an illusion. Without fail, Apollo is swept into the undertow of the Dionysian dissolution of identity. It undermines for him the idea that the beautiful illusion of his own self, with its glistening abstraction and its abundance of rational light, might in truth represent only an objectification of the amorphously suffering god, Dionysus. What does all this mean for the actor on stage with his mask of the two deities? To what extent does this illuminate for him the structure of his own subjectivity? What does it profit his experience of himself to appear on stage in this way? The thinking mime is, I believe, not able to recognise that he himself is not a quote-unquote one, a unified subject, but rather a dual subject whose dreams of being able to possess himself as one. A dual subject who dreams of being able to possess himself as one. This dual existence no longer has the amorphous quality of an unformulated yearning and the pretentious pathos of he who feels that he is pregnant with his own self. This dual existence defines itself within the context of a thinking uneasiness. Rigorous fluctuation and reflection between the Apollonian and Dionysian dimensions of the mask. This uneasily repeated fluctuation establishes the pattern of thought for an all-penetrating critical distrust. A mechanism transformed Nietzsche into a philosopher. The Apollonian in him suspected he, that he was at bottom only a Dionysian phenomenon. While the Dionysian saw through himself with the penetrating clairvoyancy of one who is reminded of his Apollonian castration. He feels like a mere civilised satyr, like a he-goat in place of a he-goat who can no longer believe in himself because he must understand that his present self is only a substitute for his true self. In this way, Nietzsche has set in motion an unprecedented intellectual psychodrama. Through his audacious game with the double mask of the deities, he has made of himself a genius of self-knowledge as self-accusation. He has become a psychologist spontaneously, he has become the first philosopher to be a psychologist as philosopher. His antiquating role playing has his antiquating role playing has set him on this path. Nietzsche always finds himself in a position in which he faces himself as a transparent phenomenon. He does not believe in himself as Dionysus because he has had to sacrifice his wild lower half to the Apollonian compromise. Conversely, he has just as little belief in himself as Apollo, because he suspects himself as being merely a veil before the Dionysian. The self of the thinker on stage that is in search of itself oscillates within the confines of a sensational reflexivity, back and forth between the frozen halves of his mask. He relinquishes himself to a circular process of total self-distrust, which in time will mount into a distrust of all truths and all surrogates, but which at the same time rises up in a despairing praise of the illusion of autonomy and the divine impenetrability of the phenomenal. Whatever position the ego may assume, whatever quote-unquote representation of itself it may choose to offer, it will perpetually sense that the other side the displaced aspect is lacking. Within the framework of this knowledge-laden, confused fluctuation between the process of masking and unmasking, Nietzsche's third face develops, with dramaturgical repercussions of the most impressive kind. It is the mask of Nietzsche, the quote-unquote philosopher, 
the psychologist, the critic of knowledge, the thought dancer, the teacher of the affirmative pretense, Verstellung, with this third face, Nietzsche begins to come dangerously close to his, quote-unquote, become who you are. Dangerous because this mask and its misleading optimism could induce Narcissus to tumble into his own image. The danger that emanates from the image always strikes the person who passionately desires at his weakest point the fact that he would like to have in reality what he allows himself to have only in the image, in the imaginary modus of representation. Dionysus does not permit himself to possess, and whatever can be possessed is not Dionysus. Therefore the greatest danger for Nietzsche lies in wanting to incarnate Dionysus, so as to at least be able to take possession of him in his incarnate form. On the basis of his theory of bipolar artistic forces, Nietzsche immediately emerges as a virtuoso in the art of an uneasy kind of self-reflection that does not believe in its own observations. It does not believe itself, not because it has renounced itself or because it would be a quote-unquote totalizing critique of reason, but rather because the self of this reflection is constituted in itself. An sich beschaffen in such a way that that which would allow it to believe in itself must always elude it. Nietzsche's dramatic thought is in the process of discovering that it is absolutely impossible for self-reflection and identity, in the sense of an experience of unity that could lead to contentment, to occur simultaneously. Whether as Apollo or as Dionysus, the named, identified, and masked subject is never permitted to believe that it has arrived at the foundation of its own identity. For as soon as it sees itself, the subject is already seen through itself as something wherein it cannot set its mind at ease, because it is lacking the best part of itself, its other. Thus, Nietzsche's theatrical experience of self sets in motion a perfect system of, for self-disillusionment. Whatever might say I upon the stage will be a symbolically represented I, an Apollonian artistic creation, which we hold out before us like a veil to protect ourselves from perishing of the complete truth.